Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to yet another episode of The Plunge, my podcast where I discuss all things about business, uh, finances, education, and pretty much the platform that I use to be able to inspire young people out there to take you know their life seriously uh, around the subject of their careers and their futures. Uh, the subject of The Plunge comes from the episode which I did uh, a few months back called the plunge of no permission where you're pretty much saying to the world you don't need any permission to start living your life you're not trying to wait for a job opportunity you're not trying to wait for a business opening you're not trying to wait on your parents or your peers approval you're just going to take life by the horns and you're going to knock yourself out and that is what this entire show is about and today I am incredibly excited to have in the studio, this amazing studio of mine, uh, one of my good friends. We've known each other for... How long have we known each other? Too long. Too too long works, right? For decades. And... um, I'm really privileged to have him in the studio today to discuss about finances and how it is important as a young person to really take your finances seriously and as a person who works in the financial district himself or industry or sector, he is the best person I know to talk about this subject. Tatenda Zumbuno, what up though? What up, what up, what's happening? My you, guy. You good? What's good? Where have you been, bro? I've been around, I've been around. Well, I've been in Zim for about a week or so now, but about before, a week or so. About a week or so, you know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Um, but spent the past year or so in Sydney, sunny Sydney, right. on the east coast of Australia. Mm-hmm. And before that, I spent about seven, if not eight years in Perth on the west coast. Right, okay. Yeah. So you basically, you were born and raised in Zim. Yes. Left when you were 18, 19. That's exactly right. And you had never come back. Pretty much. All right, cool. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> so I used to, I mean, when I was studying, it was yeah. a lot easier to create the time mm-hmm. to come home during the uni breaks. Right. So I tried to, as much as I could, come home every Christmas break and, you know, see mom and dad, see the whole family, all my friends and everyone. But I found that as soon as I graduated and I started working full time, mm-hmm. it became a bit more of a challenge. Don't. Okay. I'm here now. How's that? <laughs> right, right, right. He's here now. I, I mean, I, this is not over Skype, so that's that's the truth. All right, yeah. so let's talk about that. Let's just pick it up from there. So you started working. What were you working as? What did you study? What did you work as? Okay, so I I did a bachelor of commerce in financial accounting, management accounting, and corporate finance mm-hmm. at the University of Western Australia. Mm. I. Uh, I did some vacation work with um, Ernst & Young in my penultimate year, my second last year with them, and uh, spent about two weeks working, just doing, I mean, the expectation was we'd be running around getting people's coffees and things like that right. as an intern. Right. That's what most people think that That's what the movies do. say as well. That's what they say, right? Mm-hmm. In the movies and all of that. Whereas I found that we were actually given, let's call it some, like, just tangible work that's things... That we could actually sink our teeth into as far as like audit work goes, because that's the division I was placed in. Right. While I was at Ernst Young. So based on I guess my time there, I was made an offer to join them full time upon graduation, mm-hmm. which is uh, pretty much the start of twenty twelve mm-hmm. or twenty eleven rather. Mm-hmm. And um, what I found was it was. In one sense, it lived up to certain expectations, but didn't live up to others. Okay. So I found that basically they sort of maybe created an impression that, you know, it was all going to be fun and games and we just party up a storm all the time mm-hmm. and forget work type of thing. Mm-hmm. What work mm-hmm. was almost the impression that I was given before I joined them. Mm-hmm. Whereas I found that when I did join them, it was it was tough. It was a tough gig. And um, it wasn't easy by any by any measure right now so <clears throat> i mean i did that for about a year and a half or two years mm-hmm. moved on to stanton's international after that mm-hmm. spent about 18 months there and then um at the beginning of 2016 i took the plunge as they say and All decided right. to move to the east coast and i joined croho with where i've been working ever since Dope, man. And uh, thank you for using the terminology plunge, trying to coin that. <laughs> <laughs> right? So that's okay. So that that's a, a fairly impressive resume. Um, how old are you? I'm um, 26. 26 years old. And you've done quite a lot of stuff for yourself. Now, obviously working for Ernst & Young, uh, Stanston International, and where are you right now? 
I'm a crow hill. Yeah, crow hill. Uh, and that means you've handled quite a few paychecks. I mean, yeah, not as many as I would have liked. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, quite of few, course, yeah. of course. But you've, you've handled a few. So what, what have you learned about money? Seeing okay. as, because usually as a young person, and I've got my own experiences and mm-hmm. we'll bounce back on this. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I started to earn my first few paychecks, yes. uh, best believe mm. there was some reckless, mm-hmm. some reckless spending. Yeah. You know, obviously you do the Naturally, traditional, yeah. buy your Xbox, buy ridiculous shoes, mm-hmm. clothes and all that other mm-hmm. stuff. And then you have that first bill and you're like, oh snap, my bad. Mm-hmm. Uh, bills? Yeah. What's this? What? <laughs> <laughs> right? And it was just, it was a, a sharp <clears throat> learning curve. Yeah. But what was yours like? What did you learn about money as you started getting okay. some? So I guess a bit of the background about me, like growing up when it came to money was, I, I used to be a miser. Okay. Like I, I used to try as much as I could where, you know, I think I won some money at school once mm-hmm. because of some raffle or something mm-hmm. like that at St. John's. And um, that money I set aside and I put it in, t- I, I said, mom, this money I don't want to spend. I want to save this. Okay. And I want to wait until there's something that I want to buy, and then I'm gonna buy it. Mm. So mom took me to um, what was the main bank? With okay, I'm gonna call it Zim Bank. Right. Right. Okay. All right. So we went to Zim Bank, and yeah. I opened my first account. I deposited my money, and then ever well from then on, or from that point on, I tried to whenever I had any sort of windfall or any sort of pocket money, I mm. went to the bank and I banked it. Only problem was we we're living in Zimbabwe. Right. And the problem was we were starting to enter into that hyperinflationary environment there we go. whereby there's almost no point in trying to save. Mm-hmm. Right? So I, I lost it all. Oh, well, I say all, but it was probably like maybe a thousand or so dollars. It was a lot of money Dude, for a kid to if, have. Yeah, so if putting away pocket money and to get to a thousand and save it, that's incredible discipline. That's crazy. That's yeah. Good. yeah. So I, I was developing a good habit mm-hmm. at that age and I didn't realize it. And I probably didn't appreciate it until I came to my adult years. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, certain economic environments are more conducive to savings. Right. As opposed to others. So if you're in a hyperinflationary environment, such mm-hmm. as the one we were living in, mm-hmm. then the best thing to do in that sort of environment is actually borrow money. Because by the time you repay that money, you're paying it back with money that's of less value than when you borrowed it. Do you know how many people like bought houses, cars, yeah. using that sort of Assets. mathematics? You gotta, but before you yeah. carry on, this is mm-hmm. now a great story, but I just mm-hmm. wanted to ask you, do mm-hmm. you find, is that, would you have any moral dilemma? Okay. Doing that purposely, knowing that you are borrowing money in an economy that is crashing so that you don't have to pay back the same amount. I mean, okay. Because I, I know... They say, though, that when it comes to things like investments and when you're doing business and things like that, it's, yeah. it, it is, there is the moral aspect of it mm-hmm. and certain things are in the gray. But they do say to try as much as you can to remove emotion from the investment decision. Okay. Yeah. All right. So so you have so you'd be able to sleep at night. I I, I would be okay with that. All right, cool. Personally, I would yeah. too. I'm just, <laughs> <laughs> just so we're on the same page. Right? Right? Yeah. I'm, not, you know, I'm, we, I'm, I'm talking to the same person right yeah. now. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right, that's cool. All right, now carry on your story. Cool. Yeah. So I basically okay. Fast forward. Let's call it fifteen years or so, whatever, mm. or ten or fifteen years. Now I I'm at uni. I've done my thing. Finished. Graduated. Started work now. The thing is, me and my colleagues uh, at my first job. After about, let's call it 11 or 12 months or so, let's call it a solid year, yeah. we asked ourselves, like, what, what can we do now that we've been working for a year? Mm-hmm. And most of us, this is like 90 to 95% of my graduate intake, which is about, you know, 30 odd um, individuals. Mm-hmm. Most of us were like, listen, we're actually still living paycheck to paycheck right now. Mm-hmm. And we don't have like a little nest egg like we thought we'd have after working for a year for one mm. of the big four accounting firms. Mm. So I guess that was a bit of a, a moment of reckoning for me and a bit of a turning point. And that's when I started asking myself, what can I do to to stop living paycheck to paycheck? Mm. And I guess the answer to that question is in one word, savings. Right. That old habit that I'd let go of many, many years ago because of the economic environment that I grew up in. Mm. Now... I needed to relearn and remaster that discipline. Right, but but you skipped something in the story. You What's haven't that? told us why you let it go. Like, what happened? Did you finally get into a place where 
you're earning a lot of money. Money was that's something like you know when you have a steady paycheck, mm. you don't think about because you think like if I lose just twenty bucks, I'm just mm. gonna make it again mm-hmm. next month, tomorrow, whatever. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So did those sort of financial decision making skills enter into your system? I mean, I guess yeah, that's that's true to an extent in the sense that. <clears throat> Maybe when you start working, you don't really appreciate like the value of a dollar. Mm-hmm. And once you're making your own money, you 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 do have you know the trips to the mall or whatever where you're spending let's call it obscene amounts of cash, cash that you didn't have before. Right. But because maybe you don't really appreciate it at the time, mm-hmm. they almost say like easy come easy go type of thing. Mm-hmm. That sort of situation. So I found that. Um, in order to to get back on top of things, I needed to start setting aside cash. So, the rule of thumb in general, and this isn't, you know, there's no probably scientific basis for this number, but Mm. the rule of thumb in general is if you get paid, however much you get paid, set aside at least, let's call it a third or a half of whatever you've been paid. Right. Such that, and I mean, there's different levels of it, but... Essentially, once you've got one month's salary set aside, mm-hmm. that's sort of okay. That's it's a start. It's okay. the you know the basis, yeah. the foundation, right? Mm-hmm. But then once you've got let's call it two months' salary set aside, you're mm-hmm. you're comfortable now. You're you're doing a bit better than just having the one month's pay. Mm-hmm. But they say that if you want to be ready for um, what do they call it like uh ready for a rainy day right you need at least three months pay three months salary set aside to survive a zombie apocalypse to survive let's call it <laughs> let's call it um you get laid off your job or you get made redundant or right. whatever. Okay. now now you've got a solid three months mm-hmm. to find a job that you want to take okay. as opposed to feeling pressured into taking whatever comes your way right because you're, you're desperate for cash right so there's a, a guy called tay lopez who, I mean, different people have um, different opinions about. Mm-hmm. Um, but he's the one who basically, what he does is he does um, talks mm-hmm. and presentations at, you know, different venues on different platforms. Mm. And his inspiration is Warren Buffett, mm. whose inspiration is in turn probably Benjamin Graham. All right. Right. And um, we can probably go into each one of these individuals in depth, but... Mm. If we just start with Taylor Lopez, mm. he talks about how there's different levels of, let's call it wealth. Right. And how at the very bottom, it's almost like a pyramid, almost like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Okay. At the very bottom is debt. This mm. is when you don't own anything in your own name. The title deeds at your house are in the bank's name. Mm. Um, your car is in the financier's name. Mm-hmm. Uh, you may even have a boat. Who knows? Mm-hmm. But it's not yours. You're in debt. You you owe money to a lot of people. Right. You actually own these assets that you you have in your home. Right. So that's the that's the bottom. That's the least ideal place you want to be is right. in debt. Right. And then he talks about how after that you've got a level called scarcity. Mm-hmm. This is where you're not necessarily in debt, mm-hmm. um, but you, you're you almost living paycheck to paycheck, as I described okay. um, when I first started working, or mm-hmm. even after a year of working. And um, it's where, you know, there's just that feeling of not enough. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, you're, you're, not, you're not comfortable yeah, at this stage. You're not. And then after this comes um, where you've uh, a level called necessity, whereby... You've got everything that you need mm-hmm. on, let's call it Maslow's hierarchy in terms of, you know, your food, your, um, house. your house, your car, your everything, everything that you need in your life, you've got. Mm-hmm. And you don't really ask for much more at this point in time. Right. But then after necessity, there's wealth. This is where you're comfortable. Right. Now you've got enough for not just, you know, the house and everything and the basic upkeep. Now you've probably got a bit of extra cash. You can, you know, afford to get that new car if you want that new car. Mm-hmm. You can afford to go on holiday at the end of the year or maybe multiple times each year if mm. you so choose when you're wealthy. Mm-hmm. And then at the at the top, at the pinnacle, mm-hmm. comes the level I'm going to call balling. Balling? Balling, right? Right. This is when you've got so much cash that not only do you have 
enough to meet your own needs mm-hmm. and the, me- the needs of those immediately around you. Mm-hmm. But you can act.